we have been exposed to both signals and systems indirectly. By indirectly I mean we have dealt with signals, we have dealt with systems, we have not identified them as signals or systems. And we have not identified so far what is it that abstracts all signals of a particular kind and what is it that abstracts all particular systems of a particular kind. We took the example of a mass and a capacitance. They have a similar kind of behavior when we give a certain interpretation. right? And it is important for us to abstract that common behavior and view that as our topic of discussion. So we shall now go further on that discussion today. We had looked at the concept of a signal yesterday. What was the concept of a signal? Well, it was really just a mapping from an independent variable to a dependent variable. We took so many different examples, right? We looked at, you know, we looked at the concept of a signal in time. So a time signal could be a voltage, a current, right? Voltage, current, waveform. Right? We looked at the example of an image. So that is a space signal, right? A space 2D signal. And we unified the notions of space and time, all right, to get the idea of a video signal. So video signal is a 3D signal with 2D in time. I mean 2D in space plus 1D in time. So just to recall, just to recall, we need to understand two things that it is not necessarily that we have one kind of independent variable, there can be multiple independent variables, all right? the independent variables do not have to be of the same kind, right? So you can have some space and some time variables, right? And further, now what we will see next is that, you know, when we talk about systems, there is an additional point of flexibility there as far as the input signal goes and the output signal goes, right? So now from this point, let us come back to our discussion of systems. We had made some observations about the idea of a system, right? We said a system is a mapping from input signals to output signals, right? So what is a system? We had put it down yesterday. A system is a mapping from an input signal to an output signal. it modified the input to give the output, all right? <clears throat> now there was, there was a lacuna there, right? There was a lacuna. We said there is a lacuna and we said we leave it at that point for some thought and we take it up from there. What is a lacuna? What is it that is incomplete when we say a signal, I mean a system is a description of a way in which an input signal is transformed to get an output signal. The lacuna is that, that does not really cover all possible classes of systems. Just as saying that you know you should be able to describe f of t in terms of t does not describe all possible classes of signals. For example, saying f of t is equal to t squared or log of t or log of mod of t 
is definitely an example of a system, uh, is definitely an example of a signal, but a restricted class. <coughs> a more general class would be where you can specify a mapping from every point t to the set of real or complex numbers in general. So what is the corresponding generalization for systems? A mapping from every possible input signal to a unique output signal. The uniqueness is in this direction, not in the other way. For example, two different signals might map to the same output signal. Two different input signals might map to the same output signal. For example, if I have a direct voltage, a DC voltage, and if I have a resistance and inductance, right? So, you have a resistance, I'm sorry, it's not visible. So, if I have a resistance and an inductance in series, like this, and if I apply a DC here, right? In steady state, the output here is going to be zero, irrespective of the value of the DC. So, there are many different DCs which map the same output zero. So that mapping is not unique, but there is a there is a mapping for every. In fact, for now this system, for example, will have a unique and well describable behavior no matter what voltage pattern you apply here. And that's the idea of a system: a mapping from every possible x t to every to a given possible to a given y t, not possible, right? So. It is, it is not necessary that I should be able to give a closed form description of a system. This is the first thing that we have to accept in the beginning of this course. Right? So far, when we talk about systems, the systems that we have encountered have such closed form descriptions. So for a capacitor, I do not need to keep on specifying, if this is the xt, that is the yt, if this is the xt, that is the yt. I do not need to keep doing that. I can give a generic description for a capacitor. That is not always possible and we need to appreciate that right in the beginning. So, we also need to appreciate what is the concept of higher in the hierarchy. In the sense I said signals are lower in the hierarchy and systems are one step higher. What is that higher? That means that you should be able to build systems out of signals. So, where is the building taking place? The building is as follows. We have here one signal, the input signal, right. So, there is the independent variable time, right, or it could be any independent variable in general, and you have, I am intentionally showing this time axis in vertical, right. So, for every point in time, you have a particular point on, the, see, this, this could map the set of complex numbers in general. So, I think we, as electrical engineers, we do not need to be ashamed or worried about mapping to complex numbers because we realize that you know it is convenient to use complex voltages or complex currents to be able to simplify the analysis of electrical circuits. We, we, we recognize that. So, it is not surprising to us that we could have a complex function of time, right. In any case, the point is here we have the input signal, right, and there is the system, and we have the output signal. At the moment, let us make matters simple by having the same independent variable. So, let us have the independent variable t. It is the same independent variable. Right? That makes matters simple. Now, what is a system? It is a mapping from all this to all this. That is very important. You see, here there is just a mapping from a point to a value. Here there is a mapping from a whole set of doublets to a whole set of doublets. That is what we mean by one step higher in the hierarchy. And it is not just doublets, it must be clearly understood. For example, if at time t the value is 5 and the result gives you that at time t the value is 5. It is not necessary that if the value is 5 at time t plus 10, the value at the output must also be 5 at time t plus 10. When we say it in so many words, this point is obvious, but we tend to ignore it when we deal with systems. That is why I thought we should make it very, very explicit right in the beginning. 
a system in general is a mapping from this whole set of doublets this whole from, from this map it's a mapping across mappings there's a mapping here which gives you a signal there's a mapping here that gives you a signal a system is a mapping from this mapping to this mapping so it's a mapping on mappings right i hope this point is clear if there are any questions you must certainly feel free to interrupt me in between and ask the first thing that comes out as an important consequence is that since it's a mapping from you know doublets to doublets a given here that means the output at a given point t here may not be dependent only on the input at that particular point t to take a very simple example the system could just behave as a delay system so it could simply delay the input by 5 units of time so you see at the output whatever was the input 5 seconds ago perfectly valid as a system so what are we doing we are just taking this input signal and we are pushing the whole thing forward we are pushing the independent variable axis down by 5 units and the uh, and up by 5 units whatever right and the output axis is remaining the same that's an example of a delay system a system where the output is simply a delayed version of the input and very clearly if that is the case then the output at time t is not a function of the input at time t it's an input it's a function of the input at time t minus 5 conversely if the output is a delayed version is an advanced version say i mean although it might at this moment seem a little counter intuitive to have advancement in time and therefore maybe we should talk about advancement in space so suppose i have an image in space there is nothing wrong about going forward or backward so i could shift the image to the right to the left upward or downward so to speak right and all of them will satisfy the requirement that the output at a given point on the output image is not a function of the input at that point on the input image it's a function of some other point on the input image so this is another point that we need to appreciate very very clearly let's put down the points very very explicitly in our discussion yeah so what are the two points that we have made point number 1 a system is a mapping over mappings mapping over mappings and point number 2 output act some value of independent variable may not depend may not only on input at that independent variable I said may not. It doesn't say does not. All these mean different things, right? I'm not saying does not. It may not, and it may not depend. So each of these words is important. You see, may not, not does not, and only. So it may. There are various possibilities. It may depend only on the corresponding value of the ind independent variable at the input. It may depend on that value and some other values. It may not depend on that value at all. let's take examples of all of these let's as so as i said let's confine our attention to systems that work on time inputs and give you time outputs right for the moment let's take that class of systems so we have input is xt and output is yt
for a few lectures let us standardize notation right and whenever i wish to refer to the system i shall use script s right so let's standardize this notation for the moment now you see here <clears throat> what are we really doing we wish to have a relation between xt and yt so let's put down various possible relations let's assume that yt let's take the simplest case yt is equal to xt right perfectly perfectly acceptable this is a system in fact it's an identity system perfectly acceptable right and here it is true that the output at time t depends on the input at time t and only at time t perfectly fine right y t is x of t minus 5 what is the situation the output at time t does not depend on the input at time t but depends on the input at time t minus 5 y t is x t minus 5 plus x t now what's the situation it depends on the input at time t and also on the input at time t minus 5 now we go a step further why just two it could be this way it could be x t i mean it could be y t is x t or x lambda integrated from minus 5 to t some fixed number to t so essentially it is the area of the function x or area under the signal from minus 5 up to the point t now of course we must respect the direction of the area so if t is before if t is before minus 5 then we need to calculate the area in the reverse direction if t is after minus 5 we need to calculate the area in the forward direction so we need to respect the area that's what this means right it's not the module so we it could also be the modulus of this right that's a that has a different interpretation so the point is that the the output at a particular point t might be a function of many different inputs i mean many different points of the input in fact even this really is a bit of a restrictive class of systems so what i've given you is again examples of systems that have what is called a closed form description all these systems have a closed form description there could be some very peculiar systems that don't even have this that means i might want to say that white the only way to specify the system is tell me all possible xt's and i'll tell you all the corresponding possible yt's just as you can have highly discontinuous or highly pathological functions where the only way to specify them is to tell me what is the value of t i'll tell you what is the value of xt right those are pathological cases right in the first course let's not be burdened with them right so we'll we'll accept at least initially that most of the systems that we deal with shall have a description see we now we, we the next come out with is the notion of a system description so what is a system description a system description is an explicit relation not necessarily explicit explicit or implicit relation between xt and yt let's take examples of both an explicit description for example yt is xt squared 
explicit description. Y t minus x t into y t minus 1 is 5 implicit description. Again, we shall focus at least initially largely on the cases where there is an explicit description. Now, explicit is a little tricky. For example, what would you call a description like this? Suppose I had this situation y t minus y t minus 1 is x t. What, what should we call this? Should we call it explicit or should we call it implicit? Right? Well, people differ in their opinions, but we can I think safely call it explicit for the reason that well I will I'll prefer to use the idea of explicit to mean that one can clearly identify how the output at time t can be obtained from other outputs and inputs at other times. So, if I can separate out my x t right and now there again there is a catch in that case my earlier statement my earlier example of this should fall under the class of explicit systems because I can separate I can write down y t is x t y t into y t minus 1 plus 5. So, you know it makes me a little uncomfortable to use this definition, definition of explicit because the problem is that you know although one can explicitly write down y t in terms of other values of y and other values of x, I do not find myself being able to separate x and y that is the problem. So, what is the additional thing that I need to put in? Not only can I write y t in terms of other y's and other x's, but I can separate out the terms with y and the terms with x. Right? In fact, preferably as a linear combination. Right? See, actually, the idea is the following. It's not the the deeper idea behind explicit and implicit is the following. You see, in an explicit system description, no matter how you write it, that's irrelevant. If I give you x t, it should be able to it should be possible for me to calculate y t systematically going from t equal to minus infinity to plus infinity and I should be able to describe a procedure for doing that. So, for example, if I have y t is equal to x t squared, there is a very systematic procedure. For every point t, I know x t. So, I can systematically write down y t starting from t equal to minus infinity to plus infinity. In an implicit description, that may not be possible from the description itself. You may have to modify the description to come to a situation where I can explicitly put, I can clearly write down y of t as a function of t from minus infinity to plus infinity. This is the subtle difference between explicit and implicit. But let us not get too much into that argument, that is not so important to us. Let us focus our attention for the moment on explicit descriptions, right. Let us not, implicit descriptions are interesting, but they will be useful only if we can get an explicit description out of them for most realistic situations, right. There are some situations where the implicit description might itself be useful to come to certain conclusions, but let us not get into that. We, we, we need to be aware of it, but we do not need to deal with that situation in such depth at the moment. So, we will we'll accept that we have an explicit description. Right? All right. Now, with an explicitly described system, what is the next thing that we need to worry about? We need to worry about system properties. Right?
we need to worry about system properties and what can system properties be like and what do we mean by a system property. Let us take an example, right? we will first begin with the property of memory. And let us assume, you know, at the moment what we will do is we will take examples of systems where I can write down y t explicitly in terms of x t and other y t's and I can make a systematic calculation, right. So, we have an explicit description. So, let us take two different situations. y t is x of t the whole squared, y t is x of t plus x of t minus 5 the whole square. In this case, the output at time t relates only to the input at time t. So, the system does not remember the moment the input is presented at a particular point t, the output can be calculated, right. So, we say the system has no memory. So, in other words, how do we define a system with memory or sorry, how do we define a system without memory? A system, maybe let me ask the class, yeah, can we now use this as an example to define a system without memory? Anyone? can be formulated in terms of the independent variable. Let me give you a hint, the output at a particular value of the independent variable, yeah, anyone, yeah, yes. All right, yeah, yes, Nirmesh, yeah. Good, very good. All right, all right, all right, okay. So, we will, uh, I will just repeat the answers that were given, all right. The first, so I think we will need to speak, you know, we will need to speak into the microphone probably to be able to capture this uh, anyway. So, we will keep that in mind in future, right. But let me just repeat the answers given. The first answer given was that the value of the output at a particular value of the independent variable depends only on the value of the input at that particular value of the independent variable, perfectly correct, right. So, a system with no memory is one where the output at a particular value of the independent variable depends only on the input at that particular value of the independent variable. And therefore, Nirmesh also that was given, right, said by Amit, Amit said this, that is correct, right. And Nirmesh followed it up by saying that it means that there are doublets to doublets, right. There is a doublet here, t to x of t, maps to this doublet, t to y of t. So, it is a mapping from doublets at the input to doublets at the output. But in general, a system could have a mapping from many doublets at the input to a particular doublet at the output. So, we are in a memoryless system, we are restricting ourselves to the class where there is a mapping from one doublet to another doublet. That is another slightly more advanced interpretation. And yes, uh, Nikhil has a question. Just 
I think we should sort this out. Let me just turn on the sun. Anyone wants to answer that? And So you can calculate the mic amongst you. Now that's that's very good. So there are so many observations that come out of this, right? The first thing is, is it that a mapping of doublets to doublets? So here you have doublets to doublets. Does that necessarily mean the system is memoryless? No. For example, y of t is x of t minus 5 is not a memoryless system because it requires inputs at a different time. So not only must it be a mapping from doublets to doublets, but it also must be a doublet with the same first argument. right? So although a system without memory is a system where doublets map to doublets, those doublets have an additional constraint. right? Yes, yes Nimesh, pass that mic. Okay, very good. Any other questions on this? <coughs> All right, let's let me. Yeah, I think it's fine. So the question is: Is it true that any system where you have a change of the independent variable? a system with memory, right? not a system without memory. Well, let me you know, play the devil. All right, let me rewrite it. How should we classify this system? Right? This is a system strictly, it appears to be a system with memory, right? But actually, this term cancels. So it's a system without, so it's deceptive. So now the next thing to do is to look at the system in its, so you know, now in fact, this brings us to the next concept. This is a very good question because it brings us to the next concept. When we have a system description, is it the most economical description? Right? So for this system, it's clearly not. The system is nothing but an identity system, actually. Right? And this description is correct. There's nothing wrong with this. And in fact, now you can think of so many others. I can put any power on this if I like. You know, if I put the power of 3.7 to be really wicked. Right? Right? Still, this would be an identity system. And all these systems though all these different descriptions really correspond to the same system. So what does it bring us to next? It brings us to the fact that a given system may have so many different descriptions and there might be one of them which is most economical. So one of the guidelines that we need to add to this requirement is that we need to look at the most economical, whatever it might be, the most economical representation of a system to decide whether it is with or without memory. Right? 
Now it is quite clear that a given system can have many different descriptions that is quite clear. Can the other be true? For example, can many different what, what is the converse? Can, yeah, can the same description correspond to different systems? Right? Well, not impossible and that actually arises more, see this problem arises not because of, see the, 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 this uh, multiplicity of descriptions is a fundamental multiplicity in the sense that if you had a, a stupid computer which actually did all this another stupid computer which did just y t is equal to x t they would give you the same output. But the two stupid computers would be doing different things. You see my point? I mean they would be doing different things, right? So this is actually a multiplicity which exists because of operation, right? But normally the other way that is the same description corresponding to different systems is normally a multiplicity of language. For example, y t is square root of x t. Could be a system, the same description could correspond to different systems. That is because the square root operation is not a one to one operation. So, in that sense, I mean in, in a certain sense this is a multiplicity of language in the sense that if you could specify that x t is always positive and I always take the positive square root, then it reduces this multiplicity, right? So, it is more a multiplicity of specification, but this multiplicity exists or for that matter if you take the cube root then you have three possibilities and so on. For complex numbers in general the cube root is, is three valued, right? And so on. So, it is very clear that this uniqueness is not always true. A given system may have multiple descriptions, a given description may have multiple systems corresponding to it. We should be aware of this multiplicity, although again it tells, what does it tell us? It does not say that we have to get lost in that multiplicity, it just tells us that we should be careful to take care of this multiplicity when we deal with systems, all right. All right, so coming back to the idea of memory, we were talking about system properties and we said we must specify what we mean by a system with memory. So, a system with memory is one. So, I think it is very clear. A system with memory is one where output at a given independent variable value depends on at least one and actually depends. You see it is important to write actually here. At least one value of independent variable elsewhere And what does actually mean? Actually is to take care of that problem, right? Where you have a false dependence x t minus x t minus 5 plus x t minus. What does it, how do, now how can we capture this actually concept in operation? Well, by the principle of change, by the principle of change. What does it mean? If I change the input at a particular point, at a particular value of the independent variable, the output must change at at least one other point on the independent variable axis. So, the idea of actual dependence can be captured with this notion of change by the notion of perturbation. What I am saying is for example, if I disturb the input, if I take the system y t is x t plus x t minus 5 minus x t minus 5. If I change the input x t at time t equal to 10, its effect is going to be felt only on the output at t equal to 10. 
that if y t is equal to x t minus 5, the output the input at t equal to 10 will affect the output at t equal to 15 at least one other point and therefore that is what really determines a system with memory. So, if you wish you may wish you can modify this definition by saying a system with memory is one where the output at a given where the input where a change in the input at a particular value of the independent variable has an effect in general on at, at least one other value of the independent variable at the output right has an effect on at least one other value of the independent variable at the output for at least some signals x t right there are some signals in x t at some particular point t equal to t 0, it is going to have an out effect on the output at some point t not equal to t 0. I am not saying greater than t 0, less than t, that is not the relevant situation, that is not the relevant point right now. It could be after t 0, before t 0, that is irrelevant, right. Yeah, there is a question. Yes. So, yeah, there's another question. Yeah. Also, uh, memory is defined with respect to an independent variable which is common to both the output and the input. Good. Very good. So, there are two very pertinent points brought out here. Let me answer the first question. Even if there is one situation where a particular input change at time t equal to t 0 results in outputs changing at time other than t 0, we say the system has memory. Even if there is one such case, right. It may not happen for all t. There might be some t's where, you know, there could be systems which are very, which are extremely, you know, extremely lazy in the sense they start only from time t equal to, no matter what the input is, their result will only appear after t equal to 0. So, that, that could happen or there might be systems that simply ignore the input before t equal to t 0 uh, t equal to 0 and they look at only the output the input after t equal to 0 it can happen. For example, y t is equal to x t for t greater than 0 and less and equal to 0 for t less than 0 is, an, is a system and whatever happens for t less than 0 does not affect the output. But whatever happens for t greater than 0 affects the output. So, it is a system with, of course, this is a system without memory, but you know y is equal to x t minus 5 for and so on you could modify it, you know, so that it has this property. The point is that, you know, a system could behave obstinately for some time and then, you know, start behaving well afterwards. Even then it could be a system with memory, right. But the moment a change in the input at a particular point t equal to t 0 results in a change in the output at some other point t not equal to t 0 for any case it is sufficient that the system have uh, be classified as one with memory. Yeah. The second question relates, uh, can I just have the second question again? Yeah. Ah, yes, yes, that is a very valid point, yeah. That is that is an extremely important observation. The idea of memory and no memory is meaningful only for a class of systems. Nirmesh has brought that out very correctly. The idea of memory and non-memory is meaningful only for systems where the input and the output signals are on the same independent variable. Of course, we agree that we you know constrain ourselves. So, in fact, let us for the moment constrain ourselves to only that class. In fact, all you know a number of the properties that we are going to discuss now are going to be pertinent only to that class of systems. As we recognize, there is no there is no meaning in talking about memory or no memory where the input and output independent variables are different. For example, suppose the input where see I will give you what could be an example of a what is a physical example of a system where the input and output uh, different can we can we think of a physical example? I mean it is not at all difficult if you think of the laboratory situation you easily come out with one. You have been using it all the time in your electronics laboratory. A physical example, you know, give me a box, I can take you to the laboratory and show you, here is a system.
Okay, the answer given is that there is a loudspeaker where the input is an electrical signal and the output is a voice signal. Now, is that a correct? Well, both of them are functions of time, right? I am saying the input and output are different, have different independent variables. Yes, Nirmish, yes. An oscilloscope, yes. An oscilloscope, a plotter, an oscilloscope. In an oscilloscope, you have an in, a waveform which is a function of time, an electrical voltage or current, and it is plotted as a function of space. Perfectly valid, that is a system. But there, there is no point of talking about memory or no memory, there is no meaning. Right? Unless you establish a correspondence, unless you establish not only a correspondence, but an order of correspondence. So, I mean, although one can, you know, bring out some funny notions of memory less and non, but, but there is no real meaning in talking about memory in situations where the system has inputs and outputs on different independent variables. So, we should for some time concentrate only on systems that have inputs and outputs on the same independent variable, right? This is the first property, memory. So, we have systems with memory and we have systems without memory, right? The next property. Now, again, the second property that we are going to talk about has a meaning only where the input and output are on the same independent variable. Causality. Causality. Causal. Cause and effect. A cause produces an effect. That is what causality means. And what does that mean? The first thing I must accept in causality, the first understanding that I must have is that there must be an ordering of the independent variable. So, for example, in time, you know, let us understand causality in the context of time as an independent variable. Now, time has an ordering. I can say this point in time came after that point in time. Right? Space does not always have an ordering. There is nothing like after or before unless we define a direction. In time, the direction is fixed unless we can make use of some of the principles of Einstein. Right? So, in, <coughs> in, in time, one can talk about before and after, so there is an ordering on the independent variable. Yeah. Now, we have two inputs. Now, please, when I say two inputs, I do not mean two input points. I have two full signals. right? So, I have x1 of t and x2 of t. Both of them are functions of time. And both of these are equal up to, that means for all. Now, in future, I shall use this symbol to denote for all, right? For all t less than or equal to t0. There is an ordering, so this less than or equal to has a meaning. These are the inputs, right? In a causal system, the outputs y1 t corresponding to x1 t and y2 t corresponding to x2 t. So, what is y2 t? The output corresponding to the input signal x1 t. I am sorry, y1 t is the output signal corresponding to the input signal x1 t. y2 t is the output signal corresponding to the input signal x2 t. Right? So, y1 t is also equal to y2 t for all t less than equal to t 0. This is necessary and sufficient. Necessary is the catch. I mean, if a system, I mean, what it really means is this defines causality completely. Yes, there is a question from Uday. Yeah. 
Wait, let's get the mic. Yeah. So, what if you require some more independent variables to fix this independent variable? Like, this space is needed to fix this time. And who's the description of the system we implement? Okay. Well, the question is, what if this description is incomplete? Well, at this moment, we should assume that, you know, we have, see, what, what I am assuming is that if I know x1 t completely, I know y1 t completely, right? It, it really means that my system takes as an input only x t and nothing else. Otherwise, I must need, I, I then need to extend my idea of a system that is more than one independent variable. And then the idea of causality is not meaningful. See, the idea of causality is meaningful. Firstly, it is normally meaningful only for a single independent variable. So, it might, see, for example, it might be possible to, you know, talk of causality or an extended idea of causality, where you have multiple independent variables at the input and a single independent variable at the output. You can extend the idea of causality for specific values of the other independent variable. That can be done. But let us not, that is a, you know, that is a special, that is an extension. At this moment, we will agree that the idea of causality is meaningful only when, firstly, you have the same independent variable at the input and output and secondly, when the independent variable at the input and output are ordered. Ordered means I can say this value is more than that value or this value is less than that value. So, there must be an ordering of the values of the independent variable, right. Now, can you give me an example where there is no ordering? of the independent variable? Yes, space, that is right. Somebody says space. In space, there is no real ordering. In fact, suppose the independent variable is complex. So, suppose it is a mapping on complex numbers. Perfectly valid. You know, you can have a signal defined on the complex plane instead of the real axis. Perfectly valid. It, it, you can think of it as a signal. But it's, there is no, there's no ordering in complex numbers. You can order the magnitudes of complex numbers, but you cannot order complex numbers. So, when there is no ordering on the independent variable, there is no notion of causality. And the meaning, see causality has a meaning as I said, only when you have a single independent variable which is ordered, both at the input and output. All right? So, what is a causal system? One where if I have two, see it is the situation is making two different, the same system, I am making two different experiments. In one experiment, I give it one input x 1 t. In the other experiment, I give it the other input x 2 t. I record the outputs of both the experiments y 1 t and y 2 t. And I look at y 1 t and y 2 t and I know that x 1 t and x 2 t are identical up to a particular point in time t equal to t 0. In a causal system, the outputs are also identical up to time t equal to t 0. Okay? That is what causality means. And where is, why, why are we calling it causal? Where is the idea of causality coming in? What is, I said cause and effect. Any ideas? Why do you think it is called causal? There is a clear cause and effect relationship. The effect comes after the cause. What is the effect? A change. So, you see, until the input changes, the output does not change. That is what cause and effect means. The output does not manifest or does not anticipate a change in the input. There is a cause and effect relationship. Once the input changes, the output changes afterwards or definitely not before. Right? That is what causality means. All right? Now, I am intentional. See, I know that a lot of you are familiar with linear systems. You have been talking about linearity all the time in the previous one in a course on network theory or you know even in mathematics courses we keep talking about linearity i am intentionally postponing the discussion on linearity for a while that's because these properties that i've talked about here have to do with specific situations on the independent variable the property of linearity does not so we need to distinguish that later but anyway let's come to the next possible property of systems and that shall be the last today Stability.
Now, here again, we can take two different situations, but first, let us again confine ourselves to the situation where the input and output are on the same independent variable and we do not have to have any ordering. So, now we do not care if the input variable is independent variable is order or not. So, it could be space, it could be two dimensional, it could be anything, there is no ordering required on the independent variable at the input or on the output, right. But let us for the moment first look at a situation where the independent variables on the input, so same input and output independent variables, right. Let us take that case first. And again, let us denote that variable by t. Now, you see t does not have to be one variable, it could be more than one variable, that is it is a set, certain set of values, we define the, it could be a multi, it could be a point in space, it could be a point in space and in time or whatever. So, I am using t as a generic value of the independent variable there. Now, what does stability say? Given a bounded input. So, given a bounded input. What is a bounded input? An input where there exists now, I am going to introduce some notation. There exists there exists a positive constant m, let us call it m x greater than 0 or greater than equal to 0. It is a real number. There exists an m x greater than equal to 0, so that mod of x t is less than or equal to m x for all t. Not, not the whole story, this is just the condition. Right? What is the situation? The situation is we are given a bounded input, that means there exists a constant, a positive constant, so that the input magnitude is below or at that constant, right, everywhere on the independent variable. In this situation, there also exists a constant similarly for the output, right. So, what does the stability, what does the stability condition require? The output, given a bounded input, the output is also bounded. That means, for the output also, there exists a constant m y, let us say, right. So, that, so they could, so example, I mean, what it means is, there exists an m y greater than 0. So, that mod y t is strictly less than equal to m y for all And this should be true for all bounded inputs. So, all bounded inputs. <coughs> this is what stability means, right. So, I guess we should conclude the lecture at this point. We have defined stability. We shall in the next lecture take this understanding of stability further. So, we conclude this lecture and we meet again on Monday. Right?